than mine. I've been holding mine up. No, I mean, it's great, but I don't really try to sell it anymore. It's so, right. but, but hold it up. That's oh, I'd love to hold it up because I love the book. Hey, everybody, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about and talk about amazing. This lady is superwoman. I put her in the category of Ingrid Newkirk and Neil Barnard as literally the hardest working people on behalf of animals. I do not know how she does it unless she just doesn't sleep. I've been going live every day, one to three times a day since March 20th. I haven't had a day off. I'm tired. This lady is live every single day all over the world. And it's like 24 hours a day. Every time I look at my phone, live, live, live. We're going to find out how she does it and more importantly, why she does it. Please welcome Jane Velez Mitchell. I am so excited to talk to you. Yeah, you're really one of my heroes, honestly. Oh, well, right back at you, Chef AJ. And I want to say that after kind of being resistant to your message of super healthy vegan eating because I was kind of a junk food vegan uh, during the pandemic. I've embraced it. And guess what? I lost 15 pounds. And I said to myself, Chef AJ with her Instapod has a point. <laughs> Listen, I don't force anybody to eat any certain way. And I'm thrilled when people are vegan for whatever reason. And honestly, if I didn't have so many health challenges, like pre-cancer, I probably would still be a junk food vegan. I love vegan junk food. I ate it for 26 years, but I also know that I can make healthy food taste just as yes, delicious. Exactly. Once people get over that, this is what I love it. Uh, the, uh, once people get over that addiction to all that sugar, fat, and salt, my food will taste really, really good. So thank you. But it, look, there's no bad reason to be vegan. I don't care why people are vegan. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm just saying that, you know, uh, we all, we're not coming from up here at people who are pre-vegan or whatever. We're all improving and on our journey. And certainly the pandemic is an opportunity to withdraw and reassess and come out more evolved, uh, which we have to do as a species or we are finished. And that's a quote from one of my heroes, Dr. Silas Rao of Climate Healers. Nice. And also realize I've been doing, I've been vegan for over 43 years. So it wasn't like I came to veganism as this super healthy Dr. Goldhammer, Dr. Esselstyn. No, no, I, I, have, a, I have a long history of, of this, but thank you. And so what, I mean, obviously I know why you wake up every day and what inspires you, but how did you get this idea to just do what you do every, I mean, you're literally, you have all these people all over the world and there's probably not a minute of any day where you can't watch something that, that is related to something you're producing and creating. Well, it's a team effort. So it's not me, it's more than 50 citizen journalists around the world who are using this most powerful tool, uh, the cell phone. What I say is everybody has a network. A network, whether it's the biggest network in the world or a small one, is simply a production company with a distribution pipeline to an audience. Everybody who has a cell phone and has some social media accounts has, or even an email, has a network. We need to use it. So strength in numbers, we have a social media news network. It's a 501c3 nonprofit, janeunchained.com. And uh, we operate on a total shoestring thanks to volunteers. I mean, if we were an actual network that paid all these volunteers, this would be a million dollar operation. These are people out of the goodness of their heart knowing that veganism is the solution to most of the world's problems, whether it's climate change, whether it's world hunger, whether it's habitat destruction, wildlife extinction, um, human health problems like heart disease and cancer, uh, the pandemic that is just devastating our world. The solution to all of these things is going plant-based. We wouldn't be in a pandemic if we were a plant-based culture globally. So um, that's what we all share, this common desire to wake people up before we reach a point of no return, which we are barreling toward. So uh, really it's the, the, the contributors who are scattered all over the world, certainly coast to coast, but we have some in Europe, we have some in Latin America. We've got a great guy, Andres Velarde, who does a lunch break live vegan uh, cooking show every week from uh, Peru. Uh, we've got people all over the world just spreading the word. We have a daily vegan cooking show at facebook.com slash Jane Velez Mitchell. That's my name. 
And the reason it's under my name is that, A, uh, I was with mainstream media, most recently with CNN Headline News. And when I left on great terms after a nice six-year run, they gave me all my social media. So um, I started going to protests because when you're a reporter at a major news organization, you can't go to protests. You've got to be a, you can't do any of that. So I started going to protests and I started seeing, wow, these people, this was in New York, are going to tremendous lengths. Nobody's videotaping it. The media always says they're going to show up, but they don't. And it's freezing. So nobody's even stopping to look. I found my niche. I am going to videotape these things and put them up on my social media just like I used to do when I was a reporter, instead of covering murders and all sorts of things that I used to cover for years, I'm gonna cover this kind of murder, the murder of animals, the murder of our planet. So um, I quickly realized, wow, this is happening not just where I'm standing at a protest here, they're happening all over the world. There's protests in Copenhagen, in Berlin, in London, in Latin America. We need to cover all of them. Then Facebook Live came around where we didn't have to edit the videos. We could just go live on Facebook and uh, others, Instagram, et cetera, other platforms. So that made it easier for people to document whatever's happening, VegFest, conference, protest, uh, Cube of Truth, the Save Movement Vigil at a slaughterhouse, anywhere in the world. And, and so we have a news feed. So essentially, because I spent 38 years in mainstream media, just take some of the templates from mainstream media, like a news feed uh, and, uh, or anchor team or a team of reporters and apply it to social media. And that's what janeunchained.com is. Where'd you come up with the name Unchained? <laughs> well, what happened was after my show ended its run, um, I wanted to go to a, a, a protest and, and I was thinking about it and uh, my girlfriend at the time is still a dear friend. Donna Dennison said, Jane, you can go. Jane's unchained like that. And then we were walking by it. Ha so happened. We were walking by a hardware store and there were all these chains coming down. I said, look, maybe I should grab these chains and do a Jane unchained. And we were just laughing about it. And then I thought, well, let me call it unchained. But then when I went online, there's a lot of porn sites associated with the phrase unchained. So actually Jane Unchained had a ring to it. And I thought, why not? Jane is, listen, my parents were fabulous, they, but they made a few errors, but not with the name. I'm very happy with the name Jane, no complaints, right? It's hard to tease the name Jane, it, it's a good name. And so I thought Jane, that's one of the reasons why Jane is sort of synonymous for female, just like John is synonymous for male. So I thought, Jane Unchained, it's kind of like the maternal aspect of our world, Unchained and coming up to the surface because every single form of animal cruelty is a violation of the sacred feminine. None of these animals in factory farms or laboratories are making love. They are all raped into existence. That's why if you consider yourself a feminist, you need to be a vegan because otherwise you're co-signing rape. And that's no exaggeration. Yeah. They even have an industry term, rape rack. Yeah. You know, I agree. You know, when I think of Unchained, like what images come to mind are dogs that are spending their lives on leashes chains or elephants that are in circuses chains. So I love it. And speaking of your parents, I think I got your mom's book. Uh, oh, look at that. What it says. It's so, <laughs> so it's actually mom, happy 95th. Isn't that something? My mom was the original animal rights activist. She lived to 99 and a half. Uh, I'll tell you her story. She was born in Vieques, Puerto Rico, which is an island off the coast of Puerto Rico, but part of the Puerto Rican Commonwealth. She had a pet pig. She thought it was her pet pig when she was a child. We're talking 1916, okay? This is before universal suffrage, before women even had the right to vote. She was born in 1916. So maybe around 1921, she had this friend, a pig. Pigs are so smart. They're more intelligent than dogs. Sorry, Cabo and Rico and Foxy. But she came home from school one day and they had slaughtered the pig. It was, the pig was a farmed animal. She fainted. And when she woke up, she shunned meat and was very disillusioned. She came to New York, formed a very, in 1929 at the height of the Great Depression, formed a very successful dance troupe, Anita Velez Dancers that toured all over. Her crowning achievement was playing the Palace Theaters uh, in the waning days of vaudeville. And, um, she met my dad, who was an advertising executive, Irish American, and we grew up shunning meat. In other words, 
hamber uh, bacon, hamburger. We still ate though fish, eggs, and dairy. So we weren't vegetarian. But as I was growing up, you know, in the 60s, we thought of ourselves as vegetarian, but we weren't. You know, the terms vegan, uh, they weren't as well defined at that time. I don't even remember the word vegan during that time. So that's how I got my start, uh, thanks to my mom. She was the original animal rights activist and she was plant-based. Now she wasn't what I would call strict vegan. Like if somebody brought her a slice of cheese, she would eat it. She never touched meat, but she, she was essentially plant-based. She would never eat any dairy products of her own volition. Uh, and she lived to uh, 99 and a half. So I'll give her a hundred. That's amazing. So the, when, when did you become vegan? While you were a journalist at CNN or was it before or oh, after? Yeah. I've been vegan about 24 years. I wish I had my vegan date the way I have my sobriety date. Okay, so I'm 25 years and change sober. And it was after I got sober. I will tell anybody who's a vegan uh, or an animal activist, if you've got a problem with booze or any substance, get rid of it because you're not going to be your best self. You're not going to achieve what you need to achieve. And then take all that money that you would spend on alcohol and put it to PETA or Mercy for Animals uh, or any other organization. Uh, we could literally hit the tipping point in two months if every single vegan who spends money on alcohol took the alcohol money, okay, which amounts to, oh, I don't have the stats, but certainly well over a thousand dollars a year for the average person and put it and gave it to animal causes, just that one action. So um, basically I got sober uh, and then I was working at Paramount Studios at KCAL TV and uh, in came Howard Lyman, who is a fourth generation cattle rancher who became ill, made a pact with God. If you get me out of this surgery, I'll reveal the secrets of the industry. He went on Oprah. He spilled the horror stories of what they do to cows. She said that just stopped me cold from eating another burger. She was sued by the Cattlemen's Association. She won and he wrote a book called Mad Cowboy and he was famous at that time. He was very well known. So he came in, I did the interview with him. And then afterwards he and his publicist, Mar Nealon, who's a fierce vegan, came up to my cubicle and they said, we hear you're a vegetarian. By that time I was a vegetarian. I said, yes. And they said, do you eat dairy? And I kind of hung my head because they had talked about the abuse of dairy cows at length, you know, during the interview. And I was like, yeah. And, and Mar went like this, liquid meat, right at my nose. <laughs> <laughs> now, thank you, Mar, because that was the moment I went vegan. So when people say, don't shame anybody, if they had been oh so very polite and said, well, you might want to reconsider because rah, 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 rah. it may not have gotten to me. When she put her no finger right in my nose and said liquid meat, it clicked. Uh, I never had uh, dairy again, except about a month later, I was having a salad at a restaurant and somebody accidentally put Parmesan cheese, which I used to love on my salad and I spat it out. I went, Ugh! My taste buds had returned to their factory settings and I found it repulsive after just a month. It takes about a month to change your habits. Give it a couple of weeks, people. You will find the breast milk of cows to be repulsive. And, and also the menstrual period of a chicken, which is an egg. Yeah, I now, love that. The, the, it, your, your taste buds can return to their factory settings. Absolutely. So, you know, you know, I also deal with, uh, do a weight loss summit and we, we don't want to shame anybody. I don't know if shaming people works, but what have you found is the best way to get people to embrace the vegan lifestyle? It's multi-determined. Different people respond differently. Uh, I feel like we start, we need to start using the techniques that the other side uses very sophisticated techniques to subliminally equate eating dead animals with masculinity, uh, upward mobility, keeping up with the Joneses, sex appeal, family values, all this nonsense that has nothing to do with that, uh, or dairy products with femininity, uh, yoga. They're very sophisticated in their ability to manipulate, uh, particularly through TV commercials. Uh, with steak dripping, with all these, it, to me, it's disgusting, but it, it's actually designed to activate your taste buds. 
Um, and so we need to start being clever about how we approach people based on their demographic. So men might need to be approached differently than women. Uh, there are studies that have been done and uh, focus groups that seem to indicate that health is the primary reason why people go vegan or plant-based. And by the way, the word vegan uh, is a trigger for some people. So use plant-based. I was on a site looking at something the other day and I noticed that a lot of people responded when they were asked about their diet, most, mostly plant-based. So what I see happening culturally is that progressive people are starting to get the idea that meat is, yes, it is the most destructive force on our planet today. And they are keeping their options open to still eat some dead animals and their byproducts, but they're describing themselves as mostly plant-based. Reminds me of back when cigarette smoking was big. And I have to admit that I did smoke cigarettes back before I got sober. You know, I was one of those people. Well, when I started giving it up, I said, I only bum cigarettes. I don't really smoke. I just bum cigarettes off people. So it's the same thing. It's almost like where we are today is people are saying, I just bum meat. You know, I'm just, I'm an occasional, I'm an occasional. So that's a, a step in the right direction, I think. But shouldn't we praise people for going in that direction because I guess what happens is you know I'm vegan obviously ethical vegan but not 100% of my guests are because sometimes we're not talking about food for example and it's not necessarily necessary but there's a lot of doctors out there who are not 100% vegan but they're mostly vegan and I'll have them on the show like Dr. David Katz or Dr. Walt Willett and people will just I'm not watching you anymore because they weren't vegan but they're still doing a lot of good in the world getting people to eat mostly plants should we discount people for those efforts no we Jean Bauer of Farm Sanctuary said it best we have to accept people wherever we should accept people or we accept people wherever they are on the journey i wasn't born vegan i had a long arc where you know, I gave up this and I gave up that, then I gave up that. And I had parents who didn't eat uh, meat products. They didn't bring stuff. So I had an advantage. People who grow up in homes where people are forced to eat animals from childhood, the conditioning that they need to overcome is tremendous. So we need to encourage people, but that doesn't mean that we need to be codependent on them and rationalize and minimize and excuse to use other recovery lingo. Uh, a classic codependent is, let's say, the wife who has an alcoholic husband and she makes excuses for him. And, oh, the reason that happened is that he had a bad day at work. And, oh, don't worry, you know, uh, that car accident, it wasn't really, uh, you know, oh, they jumped out of nowhere, you know, uh, that kind of thing. So the irony is that when the codependent wife finally says, I've had it, I'm cutting the umbilical cord, I'm not going to cover for you anymore. Bingo. That's sometimes when the alcoholic realizing the safety net is gone changes. So I think we have to encourage people wherever they are on the journey without necessarily co-signing, rationalizing, minimizing, and providing a safety net for uh, their destructive, self-destructive, morally reprehensible choices. It's a balancing act. Yeah. But I'm not sure like, like beating them up over the head or embarrassing them is the best way to do it. I, no. so I, guess, I guess the question is, is how do you influence people uh, without shaming, blaming, you know, because believe me, I, you know, I, I find that if, it, if that worked, I would do more of it. You know, for me, yeah. what works is just giving them amazingly delicious food and, and teaching them how to make it. Well, I think it's a dance. I think everybody has to do what they're comfortable with, with somebody who's comfortable with that. So if you're at a dance, and I just thought of this this second, you're not gonna dance with somebody who's uh, a fabulous tango dancer if you don't know how to do the tango. If you know how to do the foxtrot, you're gonna find a partner who knows how to do the foxtrot. Boy, am I dating myself. Um, but in any case, so you're comfortable making beautiful food for people, so you do that. Um, somebody else who's comfortable with confronting people or who might have a more uh, a sterner, scoldier uh, personality, go to a cube of truth and hold up a videotape, right? Doesn't mean you need to attack somebody on the street. We're nonviolent. That's the bottom line of our movement is that 
Nobody, we've never killed anybody. We've never caused animals to die. That's what the other side does, okay? So we are peaceful, nonviolent. That doesn't mean we don't confront. Obviously every social justice movement confronts, whether it's the civil rights movement, the women's rights movement, but uh, peaceful, peaceful, nonviolent confrontation, speaking truth to power, that's a absolutely essential part of um, forcing change. So I think that everybody needs to do with what they're comfortable with. What I say is let's stop critiquing each other and let's do more. Um, there's so much internal critiquing in our movement. Uh, you wouldn't do it that way, so don't do it that way. Then do it your way, but uh, you know, do it as opposed to just critiquing somebody else. Criticism is easy proactive effort is difficult. I always say, I love the fact that I have what would in the real world or the other world or the whatever you want to call it, considered competition. No, plant-based news isn't my competition. I want them to succeed. They're do they have the exact same goal that we do. Their turn, uh, veg news, live kindly, the dodo, you know, all these groups that are now media groups that are coming up, spreading the word we're on the same side. So right. they all do it a little differently. Live and let live, do your thing. Don't put all your energy into critiquing people who are trying to save animals while there's a company that's killing 10,000 animals a day in one factory alone. Absolutely, well, that's the purpose of the show is to have everybody on who's a voice of animals. And, and do you think that, well, first of all, I just wanna say Deborah says that you look amazing. Oh, thank you, Deborah. Yep, so, and uh, you can say your age or not, but she's- I'm so 65. Wow, she thought you were 64, so you look even more amazing. How do you like that? So I, I agree with you. Do you think all your experience as a journalist kind of just primed you for what you're doing now? Yes, I think that everybody can use whatever profession they have to speak for voiceless animals. Um, we covered a vegan violinist who has shown up at various fundraisers and put on an amazing, she is like one of the top violinists in Latin America and she went vegan and she decided, well, I'm gonna use my instrument to help the cause. And she started showing up at fundraisers and, and moving people to tears with her incredible violin performances and people would give money. So a violinist can help the cause, uh, a dentist can help the, I mean, whatever you are good at, you can use that to help the cause. If you're a bookkeeper, do some bookkeep pro bono bookkeeping for a small animal rights organization. Put that on your list, you know, and call me. <laughs> and you know, one thing everybody can do, because you mentioned everybody has a phone, because every, every, at least the people that are watching is they can share broadcasts like these. I'll be surprised. Like I'll, I'll even, I don't like to keep bugging people. I'll say, please share this broadcast. And there'll be like three shares. Everybody could be doing that with every broadcast of mine, of yours, of everyone's. It takes like one second. I know. I mean, I... Uh, urge people to share and uh, yeah, let's inundate social media with vegan messaging. That's what we need to do. They can't, look, we're not gonna get this information out on mainstream media, advertiser-based mainstream media. Look at the commercials, primarily meat, dairy, and pharmaceuticals. And you wouldn't need all those pharmaceuticals if you went plant-based for the most part, okay? The erectile dysfunction, the cholesterol lowering, all of that is connected to diet to a large degree. There's always exceptions. But um, so they're not going to bring this message home. We have to do it. But the great news is just like Martin Luther had the printing press or whatever, we have social media and we can use it to change the world, but we've got to use it. One thing I have very little tolerance for are vegans who say, I, I don't want... I've, I've, I'm off social media. Please, please, this is the conduit that we have. Is it perfect? No. But we wouldn't be having this conversation if it weren't for social media. So um, we got to get the information out there. And this is what has been provided for us to get this conversation out there. Social media, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, TikTok, Rizzle, and the list gets longer every day, it seems. Yeah. How can people help you? Because a couple of people are saying, like, we have some people that do cooking demos. They want to be on your show. Are you looking for any more volunteers? 
Yes, this is a whole volunteer operation. I mean, it, it, it really, it's a team effort. We have like more than 50 people doing the work that if we were like an actual news organization that was a for-profit, it would cost hundreds of, who knows, half a million, a million dollars to all these people doing this stuff. There are volunteer citizen journalists who just share a common goal to wake the world up before it's too late. So absolutely, you can go to janeunchained.com and you can sign up to be a contributor. There's the team. Now we do have a code of conduct. We uh, wanna be love-based. We don't wanna go out and attack. We, we also don't wanna get sued. We don't wanna attack people, um, institutions uh, like private corporations. You could. You can challenge the government, obviously, but we have to be careful. You know, we use journalistic principles like um, reporting the allegedly's. So um, there is some training, very small amount of training that's required. But for the most part, what we're doing is just putting a camera on things that would otherwise go, go unnoticed. If a tree falls and you don't hear it, does it make a sound? Now, I can tell you, I have been to events that should be covered by mainstream media, but year after year after year, they are not. The National Animal Rights Conference, brilliant, filled with the top leaders in our movement, delivering extraordinary presentations, and I know you go to that, never had a mainstream media news report on that. I mean, thousands of people gathered. What does that tell you? Uh, VegFest that should... You know, VegFest LA, huge. I'm on the board of VegFest LA uh, up until COVID. We had these massive 15,000, 20,000 people, incredible speakers. Where's the, where's the mainstream now, media? Why do you think that is? That, that, that Money, never... money, the advertisers. And the fact that the people who are running these organizations are carnists. They are um, prejudiced uh, against animals and they feel they have a privilege privilege. You know, Dr. Melanie Joy is another one who's so brilliant. And we interviewed her and she, she coined the term now the phrase carnistic privilege. Carnistic privilege is just like any other privilege, male privilege, white privilege. It's when you regard, you feel entitled to do what you're doing and you regard a minor inconvenience as a major violation of your rights. So we are simply asking the world, go from this burger that involved a sentient being over to this burger that takes, tastes identical is better for you and won't destroy the planet or contribute to world hunger, <clears throat> that is regarded as a major violation of rights. When in truth, at the most, it's a minor inconvenience. I don't see it as an inconvenience at all. You pick one thing instead of the other. That's called privilege, carnistic privilege. Well, I'm entitled to do this. I've had people say to my face, but it's a choice. Well, Everything's a choice. Driving the wrong way down the freeway is a choice. It's not a good one, but it's a choice. The trouble is it's a legal choice right now. When, when animals get rights and get habeas corpus, it won't be a, a choice, hopefully. You know, uh, do I have a choice of, of killing somebody because I don't like them? Or just because I feel like it? No. So why do I have a choice to kill an animal? Because I feel entitled to their body. This is a carnist society, so we have to change it. And social media is on the cutting edge. So everybody, if you get frustrated, and why aren't they talking about this? Well, why aren't you? Do it. it. You know, it's it's a numbers game, but it's also who are you hitting? I could have 10,000 people on one view, and maybe I'm disappointed and there's only 400 people on another view. But if one of those 400 people is the head of a major software company, uh, a fang company or a, a company that has billions of dollars and can shift the social cultural thinking with a couple of algorithm changes, then that's worth a hundred thousand people. You know, so you never know, just like when you save one animal, you save the world for that animal. Do you think that any of the networks will ever have the balls to do the kind of stories you do? Or ovaries? <laughs> Sorry, um, it's just a question. <laughs> but um, uh, I hope so. I mean, I think that there are people like Fareed Zakaria has uh, has approached this subject. There's tremendous pressure because of the moneyed interest not to look at it. Um, nobody goes up and says, you can't do this. It's unspoken and obvious. 
it's kind of like, um, if you look at anything else that remains closeted, in fact, we have a story that we're gonna be publishing soon about coming out of the closet as vegan uh, on janeunchained.com because some people are in the closet for being vegan. Nobody has to come up to you and say, don't reveal that you're vegan. Don't reveal that you're gay back in the day when that was taking a risk. You're aware, you, you do the math very easily. All anybody in the media has to do is look at the TV commercials. It's not brain surgery to figure out, well, if I, if I talk about that, who's that gonna piss off? Excuse my French. Uh, so it's an unspoken rule, the truth that dare not speak its name. And we can do it through social media. And um, there's 7.8 billion humans. So there's too many people to have 20 minute conversations with each and every person. Use social media and reach 20,000 instead of 20, spending 20 minutes on one person. And the other thing is the closer you are to an individual, the more likely they are to take the information personally from what I've read. And it's actually my personal experience too. People are much more likely to get defensive because it feels like a personal criticism. But if you're talking to strangers, I've had some of the most interesting conversations with a plumber comes in to fix something and I always try to give somebody a veg news magazine or something. And oh yeah, my wife's been telling me about this. I, I, I'm really interested in this. Much more receptive than somebody I've known for 20 years who's like, Linda Middlesworth, who is a huge fan, says, how close are you at reaching Rachel Maddow to go vegan? Um, actually, I've emailed her a couple of times because she's talked about the slaughterhouse workers. I actually emailed her twice because I didn't want to be one of those pest stalker types. I'm, I watch her every night that I can. She's brilliant. Uh, if, if you can understand the nuances of the Mueller investigation and all the other things that are happening, you could certainly understand that 7.8 billion humans forcibly impregnating, uh, translation, rape, raping 70 billion land animals into existence every year, um, animals that eat at least 36% of the food, if not more, um, while contributing to climate change, human disease, and uh, global hunger, that's a bad combination. I mean, you don't have to know higher math to see how destructive animal agriculture is and how we could live in a world of natural abundance if we simply took the food, the 36% of all food that we're feeding to farm animals like soy and corn, et cetera, and redirected it to starving children around the world. I will give her a lot of credit for talking about slaughterhouses being hotbeds of COVID-19. She's done more reporting on that than anybody, although she calls it meat packing plants, which always, is it like you're taking a steak and putting it in a valise and going out on a, a trip? They can't even say the word slaughter. That tells you everything you need to know. They don't call them slaughterhouses, they call them meat packing plants. But let's give credit where credit is due, as you were saying, she's talking about this over and over again. And also the government siding with the meat packing companies over the workers. More than 200 slaughterhouse workers have died. Tens of thousands have been infected with COVID-19. And instead of siding with the people who are dying, who are overwhelmingly poor immigrants who don't want to work at a slaughterhouse but have no other choice, um, the government sides with the meat producers, two of whom are not even of the top four or five are not even American companies. Smithfield is owned by a Chinese conglomerate and JBS is owned by a Brazilian conglomerate. So she's talked about uh, these issues and I will give her props for that. Uh, but, you know, again, Linda, tweet Rachel Maddow. I'm throwing it back at, and uh, Linda's my hero too. She does V-Dog. Oh yeah, she, she was recently, Linda was recently uh, arrested and put in I jail. I interviewed her. Yeah, I remember. I saw that. Yeah. She's a senior citizen and she risked, I mean, she was thrown in the clink uh, at a time during COVID. And I know she tested positive, uh, tested negative, tested negative. Sorry, that's what I meant to say. Tested negative. She's healthy. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. But I interviewed her right after that. She yep, I saw it. It was great. I was her life. She risked her life. 
telling people that didn't know to watch that one. You, you've done so many hours of of interviews and things. Is there anything that really stands out in your mind as, as a story that either maybe was funny or unique or just touching something that you remember of all the many thousands and thousands of hours? Well, speaking of Linda Middlesworth, she was involved with the Direct Action Everywhere protest. And one of the things that really stood out to me was the recent infiltration by TXC into the pig slaughterhouse here in downtown, near downtown LA. Uh, Alexandra Paul was one of them. She's the Baywatch actress, who's an incredible activist. She's been arrested many, 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 many times. I also interviewed her. They put on hard hats and worker outfits and they walked right into the uh, slaughterhouse and they almost got a pig out. And they also captured 80 hours of undercover footage of what happens inside the slaughterhouse. Oh, the heroics that that takes and the footage that DXC put together of their operation and then the pigs hanging upside down, shackled by a leg, getting their throat slit and the poor man whose job it is to go like this. So that people can eat their Dodger dogs and their bacon and say, Ahimsa, I'm peaceful. I love everything. Do everything with love. If you're eating that, you are co-signing torture and death, not just for animals, but also for people. Because the people who have to do the killing for you, they suffer PTSD, nightmares, depression, alcoholism, drug addiction, and all sorts of other things. Because nobody wants to kill day in and day out, eight hours a day, five days a week for a living. Yeah, I'm trying to get one of those people on the show. And it's, it's, it's just, it's just beyond heartbreaking that I don't get it. I really don't. So you have a great voice, by the way, not just that, like, a, because of how you're using it, just the sound. I love, I just love listening really? to you. I just, it sounds just oh, like, just get start. Uh, oh, God. So, so sometimes so, when I do, I do fundraisers for various organizations. And sometimes when, you know, people aren't opening their wallets and I'll say, okay, I'm going to sing Desperado until somebody donates. Desperate, the money starts coming out. They just want to shut me up. Oh, that's great. So Liz Lopez, who's a huge fan of yours watching live says, is there sort of a withdrawal from unhealthy eating to vegan plant-based in your experience? Well, what happened was uh, I want to support vegan restaurants. And as part of Jane Unchained, we would go weekly to a vegan restaurant to promote it, to let everybody know it's there. And we would try all sorts of fabulous things of course, the most delectable things on the menu. And so I was eating, uh, you know, we, we make everything that you can make with dead animals or their byproducts, we can make vegan and it tastes better. And so I was trying pastries and uh, pizzas and, and I'd put on some weight, you know? And uh, so the pandemic hit and I was crushed primarily thinking about the vegan restaurants. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I wanna support the vegan restaurants. That's why we did the TV show that is on Amazon Prime. We have a TV show on Amazon Prime, New Day, New Chef. And then we have the next one, New Day, New Chef, Support and Feed, which profiles Maggie Baird, um, who is Billie Eilish's mother, incredible organization, pro, uh, Support and Feed. She raises money through donations. She gives it to vegan restaurants so the vegan restaurants can stay open. They make food and then they donate it to children who are hungry, seniors who are hungry, first responders, doctors, nurses, paramedics, etc. So uh, I was happy to do that, uh, but I started eating at home more just because of the pandemic. And uh, actually my buddy, Judy Mancuso of Social Compassion and Legislation, uh, who's a, another hero in the animal rights world, said she was uh, eating very, very basic fruits, vegetables, and she'd taken off uh, uh, you know, some weight. She was, always, she was never heavy, but she take, took off some weight. So I was inspired by her. And uh, I just started eating like oatmeal for breakfast with different fruits every day to make it different. A big salad with some tofu, uh, maybe some chickpeas, things like that. And I, I was just shocked at how quickly the weight came off because I wasn't eating the pastries and all the sauces. And uh, so it's, and I was still able to support vegan companies um, supporting the plant-based milks and the tofu and the 
uh, they have some great vegan things like black bean spaghetti that is very low calorie, very high in protein, absolutely delicious and uh, really good for you. And uh, wow, I didn't even know, you know, I started exploring. So pretty much it was just getting rid of some of the sauces and not even getting rid of them. Just you, just measuring the sauces. That was my key takeaway from the whole thing. Measure your sauces, don't pour them on like this. So I could have a little bit of sauce and it, and then you get used to it in about a week, then it seems too rich to have more than that. Nice. Well, Annie says you have a great voice and you should just keep singing. Can you talk about the documentary that you have on Amazon Prime as well? Other than also your show, but the documentary Countdown to Year Zero. Here I have, oh, look how convenient. I have a little card right here. Hold on. Okay. Yeah. It's called Countdown to Year Zero. And the tagline is watch it before it's too late. And it's on Amazon Prime. And it's free for Amazon Prime members. All of this that we do is we do through our nonprofit education. Uh, this is uh, really just to spread the word. And it is profiling Dr. Silas Rao, who posits we need to create a vegan world by 2026. If we continue on the trajectory that we're on by 2026, we will have essentially destroyed all wildlife vertebrates. We're talking elephants, giraffes, uh, zebras, you know, it, they're all going to be gone. We are destroying their habitat for cattle grazing. We're destroying the wetlands in the Pantanal, the world's largest wetlands in Brazil. People talk about the Amazon, but there's, there's also the Pantanal. We're destroying it. It's on fire right now. I interviewed somebody who said sh they're rescuing jaguars whose paws are, I mean, it's all of it for animal agriculture. We've got to wake up. So this documentary is very hopeful. It does document the problem. Points out that we kill more animals in four to twelve animal in four to twelve hours than all the humans that have died in all the wars in human history. <clears throat> That's pretty violent. Okay, That's a lot more violent than putting a pie in somebody's face or throwing a little fake blood. Let me say it again. In four to twelve hours, we kill we humans kill more animals than all the humans that have died in all the wars in human history. Just chew on that for a second. And so what we we're doing is now we're killing ourselves. We are hurtling. We are just, we're on the way to an ecological apocalypse and 2026 is the, is the point of no return. So we have to transition to a plant-based world by then. And we document how one brilliant Stanford PhD systems analyst engineer by the name of Dr. Silas Rao is creating a template, a blueprint for creating a vegan world. <clears throat> and so it's very hopeful. Yeah, we document the problem very briefly and then we talk about the solution. So uh, I would urge everybody to watch it and you know, throw a watch party, get some of your pre-vegan friends to watch it uh, because I don't wanna preach the converted. I wanna preach to other people, the people who call themselves environmentalists while they're eating animals oxymoron, the people who call themselves conservationists while they're eating animals, oxymoron, the people who call themselves feminists while they're eating animals, oxymoron. We need to get those people on board. And uh, I think there is some shift there. I, you know, I've gone to these galas for decades and I've gone to these conservation, fancy conservation galas in Beverly Hills and they're trying to save elephants and they're serving meat. And I'm like, whoa, hold on. The reason that the wildlife is dying is because their habitat is being destroyed for cattle grazing. Now, some of those organizations are very slowly trying to connect the dots. Um, they don't want to because there's a couple of things. Cowspiracy pointed out they're being funded by the meat and dairy industry in some cases. And um, they also, quote unquote, don't want to offend their, their funders who eat animals. But that's got to change. Joaquin Phoenix, one of my heroes, when he stood and he got those awards, award after award after award, and he got the Golden Globes to go vegan with their dinner, he pointed out that was, that was a huge shift because Hollywood now has no excuse not to go plant-based. So what do you think the people that don't want to do it? What, I mean, we know it's the best for your health, for the animals, for the planet. Do you think it's just people really feel they need animal products for health? Is it the addiction? What is the average person's resistance, do you think? 
Well, uh, as Dr. Rao says, and I'm kind of like a groupie, as Dr. Rao says, as Dr. Rao says, but he says we're herd animals. And so what we need are the few and the fierce like you, me, Linda Middlesworth, uh, and all the other uh, heroes, uh, Ingrid Newkirk, Dr. Neil Barnard, all these people, I could go on all day, all my heroes. We, we're on the front lines trying to be uh, shifting the culture. When it hits a tipping point, Malcolm Gladwell wrote that great book, The Tipping Point, where it doesn't take that huge a percentage. And I've heard various different percentages of what is a tipping point. I'm sure it's a fluid number depending on the issue, but let's say we get to 3.5% and then that tipping point occurs. Then when that shift happens, the rest of society follows along. So that's really what we want. I don't care about the word vegan. If, if the word vegan is never spoken again, fine. I care about not killing animals, abusing animals, torturing animals, raping them into existence. So when Dr. Rouse says a vegan world by 2026, don't conjure up vegan police in squad cars pulling you over and asking you if you have a leather belt. Okay, that's not what it is. It's more of a cultural shift. When you walk into a restaurant, it would be primarily plant-based without calling itself a vegan restaurant. It would just be, that's what they're serving. And then the outlier, if it existed at all, would be the meat. Uh, it would be a, a flip of the current system where we go in and it's mostly animals and there's a little bit of meat. It's already happening in some restaurants. Uh, I'll just give you an example. Tokaya Organica, which is not a vegan restaurant, it says that, uh, that when you go in, they say, um, what is your, everything starts out as vegan, then you add protein, something like, I don't want to mischaracterize it, but the point is, it's not like you have to ask for the exception. It's built in as a, as a primary choice if you want something vegan. So that's the kind of change that's going to start happening. I was at a green at a juice bar and I looked around and there was a big line and I had a long time to wait, to get my juice. And I noticed, is this a vegan? Is this a vegan joint? And I noticed that everything was vegan, but the word vegan was nowhere to be seen. It just happened to be vegan. They served acai bowls. They served juices. They weren't trying to be vegan. They were just being cool. And so I think we're going to see a lot more of that and that shift, which I think is also about the supermarket sector. It's so fast growing. I, I just talked to Claire Smith of Beyond Investing about these new IPOs that are going to come out, just another Beyond Meat. And what's it going to be? Is it going to be um, Impossible Foods? Is it going to be Eat Just with the Just Egg? Is it going to be Oatly? I don't know, uh, but... Some of these big companies that are so successful, when they come out, that's going to also shift it because then the big money starts seeing, ah, this is where we need to put our money. As Claire Smith said, and I'm no financial expert, but she said, if you look at the rise, they're thinking about future sales. They're thinking about trends. So they're going to put their money there because that's the future, whereas the meat producers reflect the past which is why some of these meat producers like JBS, one of the biggest meat companies in the world has created a vegan product line that is almost indistinguishable according to people who have tasted it for meat. That's absolutely incredible. Have you ever been able to influence any of the old gang people from your broadcasting days? Well, you know, not directly. Uh, well, I will say, you know, I was working at HLN, two people said to me, we're trying vegan. And I was like, yay, we're trying to go vegan for a while. Um, part of, I think one of the biggest problems is couples because that particular person happened to have a boyfriend, now husband, who was a, an avowed meat eater. And there was an understanding that that person could never change. First of all, never say never. Uh, but we have to... Uh, give people strategies for dealing with significant others because that is one of the key problems is that um, that's not always the woman. Sometimes it's the woman goes vegan and then the boyfriend or the husband is like, what the hell is this? And uh, that needs to be an entire discussion 
of creative solutions. And they say a way to a man's heart is through his stomach. That is an outdated, horrible, sexist, whatever, antiquated phrase. But making great tasting food for your significant other who is not yet vegan is one of the key ways to do it. Don't just lecture, make a dish that is so good that the person has to say, wow, I'd have to consider this. You're, you're probably the hardest working person in animal rights. Do you have time for self-care? Oh, I'm definitely not the hardest working person. I mean, Ingrid Newkirk, Jane Goodall, even though you wouldn't consider her classic animal rights, she's in uh, Countdown to Year Zero. We interviewed her and, you know, she's in her mid 80s. She's uh, plant based. I, I don't want exactly to find it, but she's plant based and she's doing lectures and traveling all over the world in her mid 80s. Uh, but uh, thank you. But uh, I, I wake up every morning and here's the thing. Being sad does not help the animals. And that's a quote from Ingrid Newkirk. Uh, so me being mopey and depressed and disheartened about things, it's, it's not going to be a solution. So what I say is I give myself permission to be happy, but I'm going to do what I, everything I can today to uh, move this forward. And then I will be, it's out of my hands. I can't carry the world's problems on my shoulders. All I can do is the next indicated thing and stay out of the results. So when I hang up from you, I'm going to do a lunch break live with my buddy, Donnie Moss, who's going to be making a great vegan dish in New York. He's one of the, uh, he's the founder of theirturn.net. And then I'm going to work on an article about co uh, coming out as vegan, uh, closet vegan that I'm working on with a new writer. And then I'm going to work on uh, various other issues that we are, I'm doing a summit with Renee King Sonnen of the Rowdy Girl Sanctuary in November. Uh, you can go to my Facebook page and sign up. Please register for that summit. We're going to, it's called Evolving Beyond Animal Agriculture. We're going to talk to a lot of experts about how to evolve. And that's been a very complicated venture that involves a lot of moving parts. So I, I never finish my to-do list, but just keep doing, 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 doing. And of course I'm voting. I've got my, and I'm going to go to the place that it says right there on the uh, ballot that I got, where to put it very carefully put it in. That's on my to-do list today. So, um, you know, you just do the next indicated thing, stay out of the results and also take time for self-care. I, I walk my dogs, I hang out at the beach. Uh, I don't really hang out, but I, <laughs> I visit it while I'm walking my dogs. I'm taking piano classes remotely with a vegan piano teacher who's great, Raman Saber. Uh, you know, um, you do have to give yourself an outlet. Otherwise you can get Talk, toxic. I'll say I, I'll speak in the first person. I need to give myself an outlet or I will get toxic. I need to take that moment for self-care um, and to take my mind off of just, yeah, like that. Leanne says, Jane is incredible, intelligent, and beautiful and compassionate. My husband stopped eating meat this past summer at the age of 68. So it's true. You can never say never. And I finally stopped fish and dairy and eggs. So it is never too late. So don't give up on people. No, don't give up on anybody. Will there be another season of New Day, New Chef or another book from Jane? There will definitely be another new season of New Day, New Chef. It's already shot. It's being edited and it will pop up on Amazon Prime mid-November. And we have Matthew Kenny. And we have, you know, he's an entrepreneur that has opened so many vegan restaurants around the world. Uh, we have Leslie Durso, who works with uh, Four Seasons, providing vegan meals. We've got an incredible group of people. So that's going to be season three. Uh, and by the way, people, you can help out by writing a nice review after you watch it. And you have to watch it because they know they won't let you write a review unless you watch it. Then go back on your computer, go to New Day New Chef or New Day New Chef Support and Feed or Countdown to Year Zero and just write a review. That helps it bring it up on the algorithm so that more pre-vegans get to see this content. Great. I know you have another show to do. So just how can we help you? How can we support your work? Well, I mean, uh, if you want to be a contributor to do um, vegan cooking segments, sign up to Jane Unchained uh, and put that in that you want to do vegan cooking. And uh, also, hey, we're a 501c3. We accept donations. Every cent goes directly to uh, this, this movement. And we, we have no, I mean, the overhead, this is my living room. That's world headquarters of, 
of JaneUnchained.com. And we operate with almost exclusively volunteers with rare exceptions with some technical people and our great booker, Paige Parsons Roach, who does such incredible work booking uh, all these guests. There's, it's just uh, a lot of juggling. So we're, we're really, 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 really shoestring operation. And so if you want to help us out, uh, just go to JaneUnchained.com and donate it. Terrific. I, I need a page because I'm, I, I need a show booker because I'm booked through March and it's like, it, it, that, I know what a difficult job that is juggling that. It's so thank tough. you for what you do. And thank you so much, Dane. It's just been a pleasure talking to you and I appreciate you so much. And I appreciate you, Chef AJ. You're my hero. You have turned so many people on by going directly to what interests them. Good food, food that's going to make them healthier. They're going to take off their weight. They're going to feel more energy. So what you do is so powerful. And I thank you for that. Well, thank you. And let's reach all the pre-vegans out there. Exactly. Carry right. on. Right. Take care. Thanks all of you for watching another episode. Please come back at 1.30 where I'll be having another wonderful show interviewing Dr. Michael Broison from the Cleveland Clinic. Thanks again, Jane. Take care.